Um, this evening's discussion is uh, right listening. Um, and uh, I make the play on words here, uh, or at least Sensei did in terms of giving me the title for it. Um, that it, it's not obviously part of the Eightfold Path, but I, I might argue it should be. Um, and because I can't emphasize enough uh, the importance of this type of discussion, it seems uh, as if we have an abundance of not listening in our culture currently, um, as much as we'd like to think we might. Um, and especially considering our current social and cultural divides, uh, it, it, they seem to be representative of this lack of listening. Um, and you know, everyone has their opinions and, and they feel, can feel justified in them. Um, and therefore anything outside of that is considered, may be considered wrong or not justified. Um, and so they're, easily written off um, and without allowing for a more nuanced dialogue uh, that might allow for, a, uh, for that divide to be not as polarized or not as, at least cavernous as it seems currently. Um, and uh, you know, we, we feel very strongly about our views, at least I know I do, um, but that doesn't mean that we can't try to understand the other. It doesn't mean we have to accept them or change because of them, but Allowing for the possibility would be nice, you know, because um, you, you don't know. And I think that that's the part of the conversation that I really want to emphasize. We don't know. So how do we gain, gain some of that knowledge and or wisdom is by listening. Um, and you know, we can't, um, if we can't listen to each other, we can't grow together. If we're on this bodhisattva path, um, we are attaining awakening or trying to awaken together. Um, we are hopefully progressing or not together. And we should try to rely on each other's wisdom and use that kind of hive mind concept so that because we'll always be better off uh, when we solve things together rather than just from a singular perspective. Obviously, I could go on about why listening is beneficial um, and why it's important. And in principle, I hope to assume that you all can kind of understand why listening is important. Um, but what I want to make the point here is, is that, that like how to listen, how to embody our listening, how to use it as a Buddhist practice. So how we listen uh, is at the basis of a lot of Buddhist history philosophy, teachings, um, many suttas and sutras go into massive detail about the grandeur of the event of Shakyamuni's discourses. The heavenly beings come down, the divas come and enter the space, and flowers rain down from the skies, and celestial drums beat the sounds of this wonderful music. And long descriptions about how the, the, the state of what is about to be happening. So much so the, the attendants come and kneel before the Buddha and bear their right shoulder and press their palms together. And all of which are just a, a way in which the, the a description of how attentive the party is um, in their listening. Because of the importance of the Buddha's words, so there, there's even a story that once the Buddha attained his awakening, he comes out of his meditation in the woods and can't make heads or tails how profound of a, an experience uh, that was. And so has no way of talking about it to anyone. So what happens is there's deer in the woods that come and sit next to him. And there's, again, a long description. The deer come and sit and perk their ears up and sit attentively as Shakyamuni Buddha attempts to try to convey the first inklings of the te teaching as he's trying to find the words to do this. Now, whether or not this actually happens the way it's actually described, all of this, it's mo more to the point is that it's, it's a description um, of a, and a setting of the tone of what's to follow, what we're about to hear, how important it is 
the words being said, the teachings being given, and the impact that they can have on our lives. Not to belabor the point, but many sutras and sutras start with, thus I have heard. It, it's, it is the premise that there are more people listening to the teachings and have passed that down to us. First in as an oral tradition, then as a written tradition. If they weren't doing that, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't have the Dharma. I think we often undervalue the impact of what an oral tradition has or can do. Because what it means is, is that those people receiving the teachings by purely listening and re-listening, and how that is then passed on. That essence is, is, allows the importance of the message to carry through. If it's important to memorize, it's important to keep in mind, right? It's important to practice. It emphasizes the direct transmission that we have had from teacher to student, um, all the way down from Shakyamuni Buddha. It's a validation of the importance of the sutta and sutras and dharmas and all those things. So, I mean, currently we now rely a lot more on the written word. Sure. But we still chant sutra. We listen to them out loud. There is something else to be gained when we hear what we are reading. Simply reading silently is fine. But when, when said aloud, the words can penetrate our being in a different way. That's, that formal way, a formal way of studying is, a, it is one of them is to recite sutra. You start by reading the sutra, reciting the sutra, copying, and then repeat that. Hopefully having gained something from those three steps. And now you go back to the reading with a more profound understanding. That reciting and copying is fundamental. Listening, therefore, is at the basis of how to learn, absorb, and follow the Buddhist Dharma. It's not simply the act of hearing the teaching, but listening involves hearing with the whole body, experiencing what is being communicated. Sound is not necessary for listening to occur. So how do we better practice and hone our ability to actually listen to what is going on around us? I make the argument in the handout uh, that we can't practice the Eightfold Path as an example, um, as effectively if we don't listen fully. Hence the play on words with the title of right listening. Especially within the, the, the three moral virtues uh, of the full path, right, speech, action, and livelihood, uh, how can we speak truth without knowing what truth is? How do we abstain from harming others if we don't know what might harm them? How do we live a righteous life if we remain unaware of how we might be cheating others? I'm trying to make the point that listening goes beyond simple hearing with the ears. Again, we should listen with the whole body. Listening in this way can provide a much deeper sense of connection. Again, along the Buddhist path together. And so many, make the, many teachers make the distinction about how, how that type of listening is described. Mostly, they're trying to make the distinction uh, um, that it's a particular type of listening. So more profound, mindful listening, uh, focused, empathic deep, true listening. I personally like embodied because it implies a more whole version of listening. It's something that you're doing with your everything. So what? <laughs> uh, I, I, how do we do that? Um, I mean, first we have to care. <laughs> we have to care enough to do it. Uh, and because it takes a lot of effort, a lot of practice, oh my God, patience. And because if we don't care, 
our listening will remain uh, self-absorbed, selfish. So we have to stop and engage. Put aside uh, all else and give full attention to. Uh, I really, uh, I love the quote uh, of what is embodied listening there uh, on the second third or the third third of the paper there. Um, and, and rather than going on through the whole uh, quote, I, there was another paragraph that I wanted to add, but for the sake of fitting it all on a single page. So following that quote, it goes on to say, offering deep listening to others is only possible to the extent that we know how to deeply listen in and to ourselves. It involves more than just tracking the meaning of spoken words. We need to be sensitive to the other person's facial expressions, posture, tone of voice, even their breathing. And at the same time, we need to um, be sensing what is happening in our own bodies. What kind of bodily felt responses are being evoked, as well as any impulses to interrupt or to ask questions, to offer advice before the other piece person feels fully heard. So therefore, how to start the, the practice of listening is to we should start by listening to ourselves. Meditation helps. Okay? Quieting the rambling of our minds um, to truly listen to what comes up. It's a receptive state of listening, and it becomes a kind of auditory meditation. But also to actively listen to ourselves and the way that we communicate. What are we saying? How are we saying it? What is my body doing as I say things? We've got to be present, aware, and in the moment to do so. That can help us detach enough to try and gain a more, we'll call it an objective perspective, as fallible as that might be. But that, ta that takes an ability to deal with ourselves and our own insecurities and self-absorption. It ain't easy. It's an incredible, it's incredibly vulnerable making. We have to face our own foibles to be able to know how to change them. It requires a lot of patience and compassion for ourselves too. We are, after all, we are our own worst critics. If we can embody that type of listening and practice on ourselves, we can start to apply those concepts to those around us. What, they're, what are they really saying? How do they really feel about it? If all goes well, we may bring more balance to the dialogue and hopefully to the relationship, trying to draw that chasm a bit closer together, a little less polarized. Now, granted, there are plenty of pitfalls. Um, the, uh, she, in the, uh, there's a whole chapter in um, uh, pastoral care, uh, the practice of pastoral care, which is a great book. Um, thank you, Sensei. Um, and uh, in it, she describes <laughs> three major bullet points, but they all kind of, uh, they, there are six, but they kind of interrelate in three pairs. So inner chatter and over-functioning. Um, Inner chatter being that as someone's talking to you, you're, you're thinking to yourself, how am I going to reply to this? You know, man, they're, they're crazy, whatever. I don't care. You're like, you're just, you're doing something else. Same with, with over-functioning, right? You're trying to do other things while listening instead of doing solely just the listening. Um, premature meaning making, meaning that you're, you're jumping in. Oh, I know what you mean. Oh yeah, is that is that really it relates to this topic and that it, and and therefore like the expert trap, you know? Oh, let me tell you about that. Rather than getting their perspective on that meaning, that's what you're there for. <laughs> that's what you're trying to do by listening. And then writing uh, the writing reflex, um, as someone is talking to you, you try to correct them while they're talking to you or you try to add the nuances to somehow shift how they're saying it. 
and then taking taking sides, obviously. And so how that in and of itself creates uh, a lack of trust from the other person that they're able to express themselves fully. So these are just what she covered. Obviously, there are many more pitfalls, but this is the type of consideration that we must make rather than complaining about the chasmous divides that are in our society and culture. We can't complain about it if we're not willing to do something about it. Or at least that's what my wife always tells me. I'm not allowed to complain unless I'm willing to do something about it. So it means you have to do it. And that's tough, but worth it. So uh, before I jump into thoughts and comments, because I do want to leave plenty of time for that, because obviously I want to hear from you. Um, but at this point, I would ask uh, if Ishishima Sensei or Monshi Sensei would like to particularly add anything. Not I. Ishishima Sensei, yes, please. Yeah, thank you for your presentation. Yes, the hearing, uh, you see, a bit, uh, very important. Uh, we have uh, three learnings in basically in Buddhist philosophy. First is listening, and second is thinking. And the third is uh, practicing. So, mon shi shu in Japanese. So, hearing and thinking and practicing. First, we hear the teachers or uh, many people's uh, speech. And then we uh, think of it, if it is true, according to many Shastra's uh, uh, writings, etc. then if uh, he uh, contents and uh, understand well, then practice it. So Mon Shi Shu is a basic learnings of Buddhist uh, scriptures, I think. This is my comment. And, and, and by the way, mon, mon being mon shin, right? To hear the truth. <laughs> Same mon. <laughs> um, at this point, yeah, let's, um, we can go right into. Next slide. I purposely left that slide very uneventful. So uh. <laughs> you had to look a long time to find that dog, didn't you? <laughs> I was like, cute animal, big ears, boom. <laughs> oh. <laughs> what questions do we have? I like sitting here disembodied. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's listening without other... <laughs> That's just it. We're all listening. Well, how could you possibly say it? Oh, yeah. A lot can be said with no words. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> On Zoom, should we raise our hand or just talk the way I am? Let's go right around. Go ahead. This is Ted. I'm over in Valencia. Um, a few years ago, I was asked to participate in the teaching on listening. Uh, that was happening at Colgate University, and I did a, I did some um, thinking, as Ishishima would say, on things that I've heard, and I made um, three little cartoons that I can share with you, <clears throat> describing three layers that we all would consider are part of listening, and the first layer is particularly significant, like on Zoom, which is are the it's the signal layer. Did I hear that word correctly? Um, did I hear that word, basically? And then the sentence. So that, that requires that one be active, maybe checking in. Did I hear you correctly? Did you say red or bed? The second layer down from that I call story. Um, and that is, am I picking up the idea of this? Like I'm picking up the idea here that listening is really important to you and that you want to share that with this 
um, community and you're doing that here in this um, setting. And then um, the layer underneath that might never be spoken at all. And I call that heart, um, which uh, I get by trying to listen for why is a person spending his or her breath and time and heartbeat right now doing that? So I might hear a story of I went to the grocery store today and bread was $2 more than it was last week. And I might pick that up and say, oh, that's a story I could tell someone else. Guess what? Bread has gone up by $2. That's fictional, by the way. But what was oh. actually... What was the heart level of it? Was the person upset about the current president or was the person hurting financially? You know, it, it can be all over the place and never be uh, ever in, in the words. So I think embodied is a nice word for me. It, go, it goes deeply in all of that. So that's what I wanted to contribute. Yeah, thank you, Thank you. Uh, it, it, you know, it does, it makes me think of, um, uh, understanding la layers of discourse, uh, if you are to imagine that uh, in those three layers, for example, you have what your heart wants to say. Now your mind has to think about how to say it, and then you have to, have to actually do it. Once it's out there, the person has to receive those words, put them into their mind, and feel them into their heart. Anywhere along that line, a translation error may occur. And so, and so we can understand how we can, it is very difficult to truly express one's heart or why it may be truly difficult to express the Dharma. You know, and, and so uh, I, uh, I appreciate that there's a Thich Nhat Hanh saying that, e saying that e even when you are with a loved one, you can never truly know who they are. I mean, we can never, I, I, I personally barely know who I am. How am I supposed to convey that to my spouse who I've been with for more than 10 years, which is Italy compared to most, but I will never know who and how she is. So it is my effort to spend the time knowing. And that's with someone I love and spend my life with <laughs> as a partner, you know? And we're expecting to go out and do that with someone who, with whom we have adversity. Holy vey! Start with someone. Start with, start with the easy stuff, right? Because I think Ted's point is is that it's difficult to feel the heart of matter, and I feel like that's where we can find some true reconciliation, some true um, equality in our society. Uh, so again, thank you, thank you, Ted, for that. Uh, Listen, yeah, please. Thank you, Gary. Well, you know, you'd think this was easy too, but it's not, uh, at least for me. Early on uh, in your talk, you, you said something like, one of the things you need to do is to stop and engage and give your full attention and start by listening um, to yourself. I don't know how to do that. How do you how do you begin to listen um, to to, your, <laughs> to yourself? And I, that, that would seem to be like the most obvious thing to do because you know we are with ourselves twenty four seven. Um, you know, and you'd think that that would be the easiest thing to do, but somehow that can seem to be one of the more complicated things to do. So how, yes. do you, how do you advise that? <laughs> yes. Um, did, did I mention you always bring your therapist with you? <laughs> yes, you yes, yes. Having, having a third party call you out on, on it helps. No. Um, May I jump in? Yeah, please, please. I would say it would bring me back to what you have said here. If I have to listen to myself, the first thing I need to do is to stop my inner chatter mm. because my inner chatter is going to take me this way. Mm. It's very difficult to do. Mm. But in my opinion, humble opinion, my personal understanding, that is critical mm. because it is so difficult even when we do our 
I go for my yoga class, my instructor guru will say, now for the next two minutes, please just leave the world outside and just try. So after class, I went to him one day and I said, I don't know how to stop this inner chatter yeah. because you have been teaching for so long and you seem to have it so together. Do you have control over it? And he said, no, you're not no. alone. <laughs> I, said, I told him, I'm very honest. I can do it only for two minutes. And I try all the techniques. They say, take your breath to the part of the body that hurts or direct your mind to where, you know, just at least to disengage from the world or from the outside or your troubles. The first thing you can do is come to your breath or come to your body. Sometimes just coming to your breath is not as simple as, but I have found that the real challenge is how, especially when we are trying to talk to our children, a spouse or someone who is annoyed us, you know, that inner chatter and that very strong feeling that I'm the expert. I have the answer for you. I have, please listen to me, yes. you know. Yes. So I don't know if I've been able to address no, because I think you're speaking to what uh, what I would say is that that um, and and Susan, um, there's there is an inner chatter when we meditate, for example, you know, and it was nicely put. By the way. Yes, Sorry. yes, and and I think so. For example, I'm I may um, depending on my meditation may notice that a lot there's a lot of angry chatter in my mind as I'm meditating. If I can try to step back from it and at least say, oh, I'm pretty angry, that's telling me something. Now, I can also say that in a conversation. Do I really want to? It, usually it's the next day when I look back at the conversation and say, oh, man, how did that go wrong? Well, here are all the ways in which that went. No, it, it, it's to look back and say, did I really say it the way I wanted to? You know, can I try to do better next time? What I really wanted to say was X. Um, being able to really contemplate the words being used, how it's being said. And you're right, it isn't easy. But nor is it trying to do that in a conversation while... Uh, at someone. So if you're trying to understand what the, where they're coming from and not having idle chatter going on <laughs> while they're talking to you, it, that's difficult too. So, it, yes, please. Uh, so two things that I, that works for me to reduce inner chatter is either take myself out of my normal environment. Because when I'm in my normal environment, I see all the things that I have to do that day, mm -hmm. all the problems I have to solve, all the work I have to do. Mm -hmm. The hamster wheel, myself out of my normal environment, and I don't have these constant concerns. Um, the second thing is for me to just be in nature. When I'm in nature, then I'm, I feel like I'm observing what's happening around me in that moment, not where I have to do tomorrow or where I did not yesterday. Of course, when I'm in nature, I'm usually by myself. So I'm not listening to other people. When I'm listening to nature, yes. it's not yeah. kind of listening. That's right. Right. I, so I don't know if that helps, Susan, but uh, Gary, yeah. Uh, this, the sound in the room is really hard. I, I, I don't think I got much of either the lady or this last gentleman's <laughs> talk at all. Uh, and I'm not sure, uh, and I'm not sure that we're really addressing. Let's get back to Susan. I I don't know if we. It, yeah, I'm not. I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that they understood my question. I think you're right. Yeah. 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 Uh, uh, but I I think what what I'm talking about is listening to yourself is a a, a broader a broader concept. Uh, and I, I'm not necessarily talking about in meditation. Or, or I'm talking about about how you listen to yourself in general, because, because we, all, we, all, we all have different concepts of how we view the world and, and also how we approach the world and how we approach the issues that are out there. So I think I'm, I'm talking about something a little bit, a little bit broader. So, but um, 
if we don't, <laughs> it might be another issue for another day. Um, so it, it's uh, maybe a, li a little broader than what we're able to address right now. I, I move so that people, people can see me. Um, and it, maybe I'm not going to be addressing exactly what you're asking either, but I think that part of what you were asking is how do I know what I really feel about something? And I think that that is a big, that is a big issue. And by that, I mean, and, and that's why we meditate, to be quite candid with you. That's at least one of the reasons we meditate. And so that we can understand who we are a little bit better. So when we're speaking, we're speaking from who we at least represent to ourselves. I mean, we, we each represent something different to everyone else. We come in contact with that's the nature of the provisional reality. But knowing who we are means that we understand our own motives to the extent that we can, that we can understand where we stand on a particular issue to the extent that we can, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and that, we're, that we're honest, that we're honest to ourselves and that, and that we understand exactly what it is that we're trying to portray of ourselves. Actually, what you just said is, are we honest with ourselves about how we, who we are? Who we are. Who we are. I think that that's, that's a big, that's a big piece of it. And that goes back to the practice that goes back to meditation that goes back to the, the lady was saying that her yoga teacher was talking about cutting down the chatter. Well, that's part of it also to, to find out who we are means that we have to let loose of all that other stuff. Some of it's critical, some of it's enhancing, et cetera, et cetera, in order to, to better understand who it is that's speaking and how it's being said. Um, and that, and, and, and as, as Koshin said, that's, that's really difficult. That's not an easy thing to do. Now, so listening is, listening is a complicated, <laughs> a complicated concept, I, a complicated I think, practice. I think you should just stop listening about it. That's, that's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, at, actually, and, and at this point, I'm, I am going to ask those who are new, um, if Jordan, do you mind? Uh, Jordan's going to take you out to the hondo and kind of show you a bit about the service and what we do and all that. So if you don't mind, keep going. Please and thank you. And then we will be out promptly. We'll be out in a, in a little bit. Yeah. And uh, Ted, uh, Ted, please. As we, oh, well, I should say, get, just just bear with us, uh, just a, a minute or two as we shift here. Koshin, you've got a, a hand up. Yep. Yep. Thank you. That'll be Deborah. So I'll just good. 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 Please go right ahead. Uh, well, I was just going to share that in the Plum Village tradition, which is Thich Nhat Hanh's tradition, they have a practice called noble silence, and noble silence is spending time a day a week two weeks how whatever amount you choose an hour three hours not speaking with the voice but letting go of thoughts and bodily things too that you you know behaviors that you so that i think it helps you become aware of unconscious behaviors as well as all the rattling going on so it it's a step further into silence from a just a meditation or something else. And they call it noble silence. And um, in the monastery, when you're in noble silence, everyone knows uh, so that they give you the space to have that and not be interrupted with things unless there's maybe an emergency. But um, so that's another way. Just another way. To Thank you. Um, any other? Uh, Gary? Yeah. Go ahead, Gary. Uh, I think that uh, confidence somehow is operable here too. If if you 
you have to, have, and that's what we're talking about, listening to yourself. If you are, are fairly certain about who you are in a, in a sense of confidence, it's probably easier to listen. I don't know. Well, co confidence. I'm getting. I, I like the word confidence. Uh, you know, um, trust. Yeah. Be a little less ego involved. Um, you know, I, I, that there's there's the trappings therein of of yeah. You know, know yeah. thyself. You know. Um, yeah. But but you're not wrong in so much as kind of what Susan's talking about. How can you how can you actually listen? To, to know okay, that. another word, comfort, self-comfort, that you have to be, you have to have some sense of comfort and assurance about yourself in order to, be I would, to listen. I would flip it a little bit in so much as, you know, I alluded to the fact that, again, the act of listening to oneself is very vulnerable making. And, and therefore, you have to allow for the fact that in and of itself, the self is fallible. And so even your, you know, and, and therefore you should probably fully accept your, your, your foibles, you know, mm -hmm. um, which is its own set of, again, confidence, reassurance, all these things you're describing. Um, but I mean, I, 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 I hate to uh, go back to it, but, but it's all empty in the end. <laughs> it's what? It's all empty in the end. Even that yeah. sense of, it, 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 there is no inherent meaning. And so all we can use is, is try to have some trust, but, but a lot, if we're actually listening in the way that we're describing, we're opening ourselves up for change and, and, and allowing ourselves to be impacted by the, the other person. If we're, not allowing, if we're not allowing for that, then we're, it, it's, it's a... Uh, Again, it's, yeah, it's, I, I, that's what I'm talking about. That state of mind where you are able to allow. Able to allow. Yeah. 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 Yes, please. Um, I, I think Gary is on to something because I can, I, I'm sitting here thinking there are different levels of or different kinds of listening. Um, I can distinctly remember my freshman year in college. Uh, I was in a uh, so a pre-med zoology class, and I, no, I just didn't have the background to, to deal with it. And when I would go there, I was so out of my element that it was almost as if that professor was speaking in a different language. And you know, part of it, part of the problem was my um, lack of comfort. Um, a lack of confidence in that class. I mean, I, I listen to you differently than I listen to somebody in a math class. Yes. I mean, yes. So I don't know how, how you deal with that except to recognize the situation. I think that's part of that's on to the speaker mm. to have an awareness too. It isn't mm. all just the listener's part, speaker obviously have some responsibility to know the audience. Well, and, and if I could just say, you know, the, the eight old noble truth that we're taking this from is right speech. And we often shorten right speech to just, you don't tell a lie. <clears throat> or you, and, and, but that is just sort of shorthand for Using speech which ennobles rather than detracts from another, using speech which um, attempts to clarify rather than obscure, using speech which is useful rather than destructive, et cetera, et cetera. It's not just don't lie, although that's the way we, we often we often see it. Uh, sure. And so I think it's important also. If we're going to listen properly, then we have to be aware of what we say. And I think that those those two things go hand in hand. And I was I was thinking as Gary was was speaking about that, one of the things that came to my mind was that today much of our 
um, communication is via text messages or emails or something in which we're not orally presenting the material. And in those cases, it's open to much more um, distortion because we aren't able to look at the person who's making the statement to try to evaluate based upon the visual images that we have of that person. And also we're not able to carry on as, as um, flowing a conversation. It's, bro it's broken into smaller units because of the technology primarily. Uh, and nobody wants to sit and look at an email that's three pages long. You know, that's so we, 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 have, we have those things that are going on. And so in our society, we've begun to create memes, which are symbolic language about something, which we take as the totality of what is trying to be said. So we're not really listening deeply at many different levels. We're listening to memes, we're reading short speech, um, and that's not, that's, so listening is part of a communicative process. And today we've, we've shortened that communicative process into something which is into smaller, smaller bits that are not as useful in trying to explain fully. And, and we, how many of us, I'm sure we would raise your hand, has received an email and you've been dismissed totally. Uh, maybe the person didn't intend it that way, but that's the way you read it. That's the way you're quote unquote listening to it is because the way that it was that it was stated. Sorry for going on so long about it and, you know, and opening it up into a totally different area. Yeah, because I, I think I think it, you know, we we speak a lot about the lengths at which Shakyamuni Buddha in his discourses may have even said you talked about very opposing uh teachings, but in and of themselves, because he's speaking to different audiences at any given time, he's using skillful wisdom, compassion, and skillful means as a way to present that message in a way that is best received for the listener. Um, that, that is the embodiment of wisdom, compassion, and skillful means. Um, it, it's it, how to be a communicator um, is then the kind of follow up to the how to listen. But um, so thank you. Yeah, we should probably. Yeah, and, and at that point, uh, thank you so much, everyone, um, for your listening. <laughs> Sh Shumon is going to continue Zoom in the uh, Kuti with uh, Kaiden's assistance. Today, Ocean talked about deep listening, deep hearing. And um, you really realize that the, how little we pay attention to what the other person is saying, let alone what we ourselves is thinking about. But many decades ago, um, there's a time I, I used to work as an interpreter and realized how little I pay attention to other normal situations. You were just sent into the room that have no idea what they're talking about. So you have to concentrate, pay attention, not only to healing, but to using all the senses, the feeling that the energy in the room, uh, the visions, facial expressions, not just what they say, but how they say it. And then trying to read um, you know, space between the lines. And again, that doesn't mean I learn it. Um, if you are not in that situation, so you just pay, at, you know, you don't spend much attention at all. And especially for those, those that you do not like, or you think that they have a different opinion from yours, you already kind of dismiss it. And your attention will be maybe 20% at most. You know, you just already put some sort of at the screen in front of you. And then this is a good practice, a good Buddhist practice, trying to listen and hear what the other person is saying and really saying. 
And from time to time, I remind myself, but you know, during the, the busy daily life, you just don't have a time, but I catch yourself and thinking about, I gotta just slow down, have to listen, pay attention. And uh, remind myself, this is a good practice as a Buddhist or anyone for human beings to be able to connect to others. And then I'm sure all of you have experienced something like, you know, your mother, your father, grandparents, they passed away years ago. And you wish, I wish I asked them, I wish I listened to them. You know, they might be saying something to you, and but you're not, your attention is not there. It's just sound come from one side of your ear and goes out. And, uh, you know, it might be too late. So we should pay attention when somebody's talking to you. And again, I'm saying that to you, but just telling myself. And I have to keep in mind myself. And um, Koshin did that, the discussions. And then Monshin is probably right now just getting ready to do the Dharma talk. And he prepared that the Dharma talk. And I'm going to read what his take of it from this discussions. It start like this. Early in a Buddhist, Buddhist practice, most people begin to sit meditation or do other forms of practice in order to prove, improve ourselves. That's, that's okay. As time goes on, if we practice in earnest, especially in Tandai and in Pure Land schools, we recognize that Buddhist practice is not a self-help program, like going to a gym or doing yoga. That's not to say that they are not what I prefer to, sorry, are not what I refer to as cultural benefit to oneself. One becomes calmer, less anxious, more open, etc. through the practice. This is often difficult for people who are first embarking on a path to fully understand. The heart of Mahayana Buddhist teaching is not what one does for ourself, it is what one does for all sentient beings and by extension for ourselves. Mahayana is the path of the Bodhisattva. At the end of the Gongyo, we recite So Echo which is transferring merit. I wish to extend the virtue of these verses to all sentient beings. Together, may we progress along the Buddha path of liberations. In other words, one has dedicated the daily service, the purifications, the offerings, the venerations, etc., not merely for oneself, but for the benefit of all sentient beings. I have mentioned that there are two basic types of approaches to Buddhist practice. One, techniques that develop the head aspect, such as analysis and concentrations. And two, techniques that open up the heart. Both head and heart practices are needed. It is the head practice that is especially difficult. I'm sorry, it is the heart practice that is especially difficult. One must enter this practice without thinking about what am I going to get out of this? We enter into a practice with a kokoro, which is heart, mind, and spirit that is filled with altruistic well beings for all sentient beings. In this fashion, we see ourselves not as distinct from these various layers of interactions, but integrated in a very real and harmonious way. We give up the I as distinct from the other and see ourselves as the we and us, the real nature of the I. Of 
the day. Listening is being able to be changed by the other persons. Hold on, hold on. Listening is being able to be changed by the other person. Mm 